I'm going to ask you to be honest with me. If I were to ask you if your mind is truly free, would you be able to tell me yes? Or would you have to say no? You see, the mind is a powerful tool indeed. It is what houses our childhood memories and those fears we had. It is what allows us to be able to process facts. And most importantly, to develop and understand ideas. You see, an open mind is very important to anyone who wishes to have an impact in this world. It is even more so important to those of you who are passionate about healthcare, about making a difference in people's lives, about community service and giving back. And as a result, tonight I'm gonna share with you the power of an open mind. For me, it started 22 years ago when I was born under the incomparable West African sun in Accra, Ghana to be exact. And after living there for but a few months, I transitioned with my family to Botswana, where I lived for only five years before coming to the United States. And while it took me almost 17 years to return back to my motherland, I believed I knew what it was to be Ghanaian. After all, I was the child of African parents who came to America in their 40s. So the only way they knew how to raise me was the African Ghanaian way. And my parents made it extremely clear. It didn't matter what my friends did, what they were able to wear, or where they were able to go. They would always say, Julia, you are an African girl. Your parents are not your parents until you only do what I say you are allowed to do. And so while in the four walls of my house, I was indeed a Ghanaian child, I didn't realize until last summer when I began my internship in Accra, Ghana, that my experience with Ghana was not much different from many of you all sitting in this audience. In fact, most of what I knew about Ghana came secondhand. It was through the experiences that my parents had shared with me. It was through seeing the black and white photographs of them in grade school uniforms, or the fact that my closet, thankfully, is filled with so many kente cloths or entomas, affectionately known as the cloth of kings. Beside being born in Ghana, Ghana was a mere title page in my life. And outside the perimeter of my household, Without the fact that people had access to my typical African name, and knowing that an accent is something I can turn on and off as I please, many people didn't know about my African origin. So why Ghana? Why go back there? What was I going to learn or gain from going there? And I say a better question is, what wasn't I going to learn? As a college graduate on the pathway to becoming a physician, I cannot wait to be able to intertwine my love for medicine and culture and diversity with that of different experiences. And Ghana allowed me to do just that. And so going to Ghana, I had three key expectations. I wanted the experience. I wanted to feel authentic in being a Ghanaian. And that came by volunteering and shadowing in places like the Focus Hospital. I also wanted to be educated. What would it be like if I was a woman living in Ghana? And that came through my experience through my internship with the Alpha Medical Center, where I specifically worked in the labor and delivery section, caring for women during their pregnancy. And the last thing I wanted to gain was exposure. Exposure in any way, shape, and form. And it came by talking to taxi drivers on my way to Accra or Kamase, it came from eating meals with my grandparents who had so much knowledge to share about the country. It didn't just come from looking on the internet and realizing what people said. It was more than that. And in addition to the fact that I also had expectations, there were challenges. It was hard to adapt to a life in Ghana. Other than the fact that I'm a night person and Ghana's about four hours ahead, I also had to get used to the traffic. To paint you a picture, traveling was sometimes like New York City traffic during rush hour during a parade. 
it went absolutely nowhere. I also had to come to the terms with the fact that I was ignorant. Yes, I was ignorant. I didn't know a lot about Ghana. I knew I wanted to go there and make a difference and help. And I knew I wanted to learn about the healthcare system specifically so that as a physician, I can truly be able to take us to the next level. But other than that, I was ignorant about how things truly worked on a day-to-day -day basis. I also had to get over my assumptions. Assumptions I made as to what people needed. I didn't really know. After all, I was living a seven-hour airplane ride away. But one of the hardest things I had to go against was my mindset. You see, the thing about people who have caged minds is they often don't know it. They are stuck living in their ignorance and assumptions, and it makes it seem as if everyone around them is the one who actually has the caged mind but themselves. You see, growing up, Ghana was never mentioned as a vacation spot. And it definitely wasn't somewhere you wanted to go and learn. Ghana was only a place that you went for service. All of my friends wanted to go to Dubai or Peru or Jamaica. No one understood why I would want to go back to Ghana. But I'm thankful that when I went to Ghana, I was able to experience pieces that were able to help me dispel those myths. I was able to walk alongside the national parks and see sculptures of the first presidents. I was able to go to the mall that was not much different from King of Prussia, actually. I was also able to learn about history by visiting the slave castles that were housed there. I remember looking up for an assignment, 20 ways to describe Africa. And I remember the top five things I saw were disease, famine, genocide, malaria, and sickness. Those were the top five things that people had to say. There was nothing positive about it. So I realized going to Ghana, I had to change my mindset. I had to be open to realizing and understanding the truth. I wasn't just going there to help them. I was going there to help me. And I came across this quote that read, if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you are here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And this is a quote by Lila Watson, who is an advocate and educator for women rights and also those of Aboriginal people. So what I want you all to do today is move forward and erase the savior complex. You may be part of the solution when you try to help, but you are not the solution itself. We must be humble when we go to different places and say we want to help people. So many times we're so focused on the problem we're trying to change, we forget that the real reason we want to work on the problem is because of the people that it affects. So it's not always that you help, but rather how you help. What difference are you truly making? What example are you setting for those who will come after you? And with that mindset, I was truly able to explore and learn how the Ghana healthcare system works. It's broken into being helped by the government, but also with the Ghana Health Service, which is able to allow us now, as of 2004, to move away from the cash and carry method. The cash and carry method basically meant you carried your money with you. Emergency or not, if you went to a hospital and did not carry your dough, you were not getting treated. Simple as that. Now, with this new national health insurance scheme, we're able to at least be moving and making progress into universal coverage. This NHIS system does not cover all treatments and care, but it's a step in the right direction. Also in Ghana, many of their healthcare centers are funded through missionary work, through religious organizations like the Christian Health Association that seeks to be able to provide healthcare to the country. Lastly, there are three primary levels of healthcare in Ghana. The primary level basically associates with those of the regional hospitals, the polyclinics. The secondary are more of the specialized hospitals and the tertiary are the teaching hospitals. 
Having an open mind allowed me to realize that as many problems as they are in the Ghanaian healthcare system, there are also strengths that they have, benefit packages, the international collaborations with countries like Cuba to ensure that they were allowing other people to come and be able to teach their expertise to Ghanaian doctors. So when they left, their expertise didn't leave. But what they were able to teach was able to stay in Ghana and actually help its citizens. Amongst the strengths were many difficulties. Culture versus medicine was a big one. The fact that many people in Ghana had geographic issues and were living too far away from a hospital to get care, they went to the over 45,000 traditional healers. They were scared of medicine. They didn't trust doctors, and even if they did, how were they going to travel there? Technology was also a big issue. So was electricity. In Ghana, we have something that they call dumso. The light literally turns on and off. And some days you're there for three days and there's no electricity in your household. Imagine that in a hospital that doesn't have a good enough generator. Money, of course, is always an issue when you're dealing with healthcare, as we know even in America. But in Ghana, where one American dollar is four of their currency, it becomes even harder. The average life expectancy in Ghana at birth is 66 while in America it is 78. And while that doesn't seem like much, imagine 12 years ago, what were you doing? Were you the same? Had you achieved all the things that you wanted to achieve? And it was through maternal and child health that I wanted to make my impact. And I learned that even though a lot of people are at the age where they're able to utilize contraception, only 30% of the people do. Imagine how many unwanted children are, as a result, being given birth to. And that is a reason why women break down shredded glass and drink it in order to get rid of births that they didn't want to have in the first place. So what are we going to do? Are we going to be closed-minded and ignore that those facts happen? Or are we truly going to make an impact? I learned this while at my internship at the Alpha Medical Center and I had the best opportunity of delivering a baby girl. And in that situation, I remember sweating so much because there was, no, there was no air system. So we had to turn off the fans to ensure that the baby was kept safe. The last thing I did was be able to volunteer at the Foundation of Orthopedics and Complex Spine. This hospital was started by a doctor who was Ghanaian who went to America and graduated from Columbia Medical School. From there, he knew he had a specific aim. He wanted to go back and help the healthcare system there. For eight years, eight years, he went on mission trips to Ghana four times a year and he took people. And when he went there, he learned how the system operate. He learned how Ghana was changing. Living in America, he was getting removed and he knew that he had to be able to realize how the system worked to be able to truly make a difference. And so I started my presentation telling you all about my expectations. But now I want to share the realities that I discovered. I learned that we have to apply the realities of the community in which we want to make a difference. Not everything that works in one area will work in the next. You can't just bring technology over to Ghana and dump it there and say, use it. They might have never seen that technology before. How are they actually going to incorporate it into their system? And the wisdom gained from those in the community can often be what helps you find the solution. Stop trying to be the savior, as I said earlier. Erase that savior complex and realize that people living there will often know much about the problems than you do as an outsider. So let's move away from the band-aid solutions to sustainability so that when you leave that place, your talent doesn't leave, your hard work doesn't leave with you, but they're able to continue for the better. Specificity and direction equal achievable dreams. So many of us want to do so many things. We want to be teachers. We want to help mom and dad. We want to be great. Well, how are you going to do that? Let's move away from just saying we want to help and say how we're going to be helping.
How much money is it going to take? Which population specifically? Is it children? Is it men? Is it women? Is it elderly people? And what direction? How are we going to get there? Successful goals are ones that adequately address the specific needs of the population involved. And so to sum up, I went to Ghana with an open mind, and I left with an inspired heart. An inspired heart that was able to stand here today and share with you this idea of an opened mind. And so if I ask you to be honest with me again, hopefully this time you will be. Is your mind truly free or is it caged? Thank you.